Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's program, Feeding the Nation, Michael W. Twitty on American Foodways and the History of Enslavement. I'm Tamika Brown-Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Let me begin by thanking our partners at the Royal House and Slave Quarters Museum, which co-sponsored today's program. I'm especially grateful to Executive Director Kiara Singleton, who's here with us this afternoon. This discussion is also part of the Presidential Initiative on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, launched by President Larry Bacow in 2019. The initiative is anchored here at the Radcliffe Institute, and we're committed to providing opportunities like this one to engage with the complex legacies of slavery that continue to shape our nation. The Royal House and Slave Quarters stand as a physical testament to the institution of slavery, particularly in the Northern United States, where historical memory privileges narratives of Puritans, patriots, and abolitionists. The royals were proprietors of a sugar plantation on the Caribbean island of Antigua, and their vast fortune came from the interwoven economies of sugar, rum, and slavery. Their sprawling Massachusetts estate spanned hundreds of acres along the banks of the Mystic River in Medford. There, they enslaved more than 60 people over the course of some four decades. The 60 includes people like George, sold by the royals in 1759 and whose subsequent escape is documented in the pages of the Boston Gazette. It also includes children like Preen and Joseph, both born into slavery in Massachusetts and women like their mother, Belinda, who in 1783 petitioned the Massachusetts General Court for a pension from the royal estate, asserting her humanity despite living in a society that deemed her property. One particularly striking feature of the Royal House and Slave Quarters is what the royals call the summer out kitchen, a feature common in the Caribbean, which was designed to spare the mansion's inhabitants from the oppressive heat of cooking fires on summer days. Today, that structure is part of the only known separate slave quarters still standing in the Northern United States. It's a reminder of the deep ties between New England and the Caribbean in that era, as well as the connections between the history of slavery and of food. Foodways and kitchen spaces can open a window into the lives of enslaved people and help us understand slavery and its legacies. And who better to guide us in exploring these connections than Michael W. Twitty. Michael is a food writer, scholar, culinary historian, and, and a historical interpreter. His blog, blog Afro Culinaria, was the first blog to focus on African-American historical foodways and legacies. His book, The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African-American Culinary History in the Old South, won the James Beard Foundation Awards for writing and best book of the year. In addition to numerous other honors, Michael was named by Southern Living as one of the 50 people who are changing the South. His writing and commentaries have appeared in many prestigious outlets, and he's been a Smith Fellow with the Southern Foodways Alliance, a TED Fellow and speaker, and the first revolutionary, revolutionary in residence at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. His forthcoming book, Kosher Soul, explores the cuisines of the Jewish and African diasporas, and it will be released this August. Thank you, Michael. We're thrilled to welcome you here this afternoon. Following Michael's remarks, he and I will discuss his work in more detail, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time. We just ask that you keep your questions brief so we can address as many of them as possible. And now it's my pleasure to give the virtual floor to Michael. Thank you so much, Dean. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> forgive me, everybody. I have a little bit of a <clears throat> anxious sort of you know, anxiety-driven cough um, that's only appearing apparently when I'm agitated and excited and want to talk. 
But um, I'm so glad to be here and I'm so glad um, um, that Dean Tamika Browning and brought up the Royal House and Slave Quarters, a place I've really wanted to visit. Um, I wanted to do a lot of things in 2020, but wasn't able to, um, thanks to the pandemic. But I think that's on my list of things to do um, when I return to New England when it's not cold, because you won't have a heating problem until you know at least May, at least, you know, in my in my book. <clears throat> but having said that, um, I think it's really important that we start the conversation with a converse with what I call um food lore or fake lore um they're not the same thing but one is definitely part of the the, the, the stories that we tell um so here this is this is how it goes so recently on facebook there was a viral narrative about hush puppies and i think i want to use that as kind of like the linchpin for my part of the talk because I need people to understand something. <clears throat> um, it's it's in our current in our cultural currency to uh, put things out that are provocative, um, often racially, sexually, um, culturally, religiously, politically provocative, and these things get a response, and those things become the topic converse topic of conversation. And there's a lot of comments like, I didn't know that. They never taught me that in school, shaking my head, SMH. The, the whole thing, the whole theater. The problem is, is that it is so not helpful when it comes to the work that people like myself do. Um, you know, those of you who've seen me on High on the Hog um, or other programs know that you've seen these spaces where I cook. Um, not all the time because of things have changed, <clears throat> but enough so that I know the, the experience of being in that kid in that summer house kitchen. I know what it's like to to experience, you know, 12 to 16 hours on your feet or to be in a space where <clears throat> I am hot, I'm tired and people's political, cultural or personal baggage comes in with them into a museum space. Because I'm not a reenactor, I'm an interpreter. I'm there to guide you, the 21st century person, through this part of the remote past, which you may or may not have a personal connection to. And that, all, that work often involves me being in, in period clothing. Some people call it costume. I prefer not to call it costume. <clears throat> that was somebody's daily wear at one, at one point. And it's rather nice. It's really, it's really, it's really pristine. It's rather um, sanitized. It has nothing to do with what was actually in the past. And some people um, feel the vulnerability of me doing that, even though I'm speaking um, with my best SAT and GRE English, even though I'm using the jargon of you know academic inter interdisciplinary fields, even though I'm being very specific. And, 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 you know, crossing my T's and dotting my I's, there are people who would rather me not do that or give a whole other narrative or just burn the place down, you know, burn all the plantations down. Not helpful, but equally not helpful is this message. Well, you see, there were these things called hush puppies and they were made, they were, when, when the slaves, first of all, our language needs to change. And I know you've heard this before, but I'm going to say it again. Enslaved and slave are two different things. Enslaved is a condition. Slave is an identity. You know, that's so, it's, it's so critical to how we frame this. Um, and then they'll say the slaves, <clears throat> when they were running away, would cook up some hush puppies. First of all, when were you cooking these? What do you know about the enslaved person's day that tells you that any old time they want to just run, pick up and run away? they would make something as, as, as obnoxious and noisome as onions in something to make a dish that required extra fat. Think about this. No, enslaved food wasn't soul food. Soul food as I've defined in High on the Hog <clears throat> is the cuisine, the memory cuisine of the great and great, great grandchildren of enslaved peoples, not the same thing. And soul food bears no shame from enslavement. 
nor from poverty. A soul food, as I understand it, um, is not the commercial slop or appropriation that one finds in American industrial food or restaurant chains. True soul food is the, is the cuisine of people who um, made something, not only made something out of nothing, <clears throat> but were very resourceful with the natural elements around them and producing their own food and, and having their own agency and ownership. It wasn't the result of the scraps of anybody else's table. But then, but there again, we have another sort of fake lore, which is Black people's food traditions come from <clears throat> their lack of ownership, their lack of agency, their lack of, of willpower. And all of that is completely not true. And I understand that that sort of flies in the face of what people understand the notions of American enslavement to be. And that is not saying people were kind to us or nice to us. It's just simply saying that <clears throat> when it comes to one's daily sustenance, we rarely, unless we have no other choice, allow other people to totally take that over. We have the option to mess with that, to form it ourselves, to create our own narrative. We do it. That's talking about human beings in general, <clears throat> but especially people of the African diaspora in the Atlantic world, African Atlantic world. So we have the plush puppies, they're making them on the way out of the plantation. Um, no one will obviously notice that. They're also um, throwing these to the dogs, they run away from them going, hush puppy, hush puppy. And I just thought to myself, who made this up? Why is this, why is this, why is this cool? Why is this viral? I can't make my stuff go viral without people making all kind of weird comments, but this is like, oh my God, you need to know this. And I think it's a general problem we have with disinformation, with um, lack of integrity and in how we tell these stories and our inability to understand that if we really did the hard work of understanding the complex and nuanced um, genre before us, you would find stories that would be so much more amazing than any of the nonsense I just quoted. Way more amazing, way more interesting. Um, for example, in Mississippi, I work with a project um, at the Hugh Craft House and other homes called Be you know, Behind the Big House, which illuminates um, the lives of the enslaved, but also their role in creating the world um, of Holly Springs, Mississippi and Marshall County. And we were looking at <clears throat> some sources and one of the grad students found something really beautiful. It was a, a receipt, a recipe as they used to call them, receipts um, from a 19th century plantation, uh, Mistress's Journal from Marshall County. And it talked about dried okra. And I had just told the student and the students that, you know, you would find these things, there are these deep Africanisms that were, that were being professed and practiced by white people, but showed obviously the skill um, and abilities of black people, especially black women and a certain, a certain group of black men. And I'll explain why there's a difference um, that had incredible knowledge that was being brought with them um, across the Southern map. Um, from the Eastern Sea border, from the Gulf Coast to um, the interior of Mississippi. And why is that dried okra uh, recipe so much more vibrant than the story about the hush puppies? Well, number one, hush puppies do have a very important cultural history, but the dried okra, the dried okra is literally someone remembering something and doing something that had not changed since they left West Africa. Um, it's because in West Africa, the dry season, the season of the Harmattan, where there's cool breezes and it's not as warm and it's dry and it's not as conducive to um, some of these crops that, you know, the eggplants with guinea squash, guinea eggs, the, um, the melons, the tomatoes, uh, the hot peppers, the okra that make up some of the mainstays, and onion that make up some of the mainstays of the West African diet are not as available. So what do you do? You dry them and you, you know, store them in rings until you're ready to make them into soup. And then you reconstitute them by boiling them for a very long time. And so you can have your okra soup, the, the dry season version. Well, in America, that would have been winter. So we already see the transfer of, of knowledge, skills, and abilities across these different climates and ecosystems. 
over time. To me, that's a much more thrilling story. Or the fact that, you know, hush puppies, hush puppies are akara. If you know akara, akara is a, um, the black eyed pea fritters that are found across West Africa. Um, some people call them kose, some people call them by their names. Um, but akara essentially become kala in New Orleans. Um, that's because the Nupe people of Nigeria, Yoruba call akara, Nupe call them kala. First of all, L and R always get transposed in languages. And <clears throat> these are the people who are being brought to the Gulf Coast, Lower Mississippi Valley. So knowing who came where is another important thing. You know, a lot of us grew up with the narrative that didn't matter, as long as you were black. Well, what kind of black were you? What kind of African were you? Um, when did you show up? So when I do my work of reconstructing <clears throat> and piecing back together this narrative, you know, which in the cooking gene involves my own family history, my own genealogy, genetic genealogy, <clears throat> I found that there were so many elements that were just totally overlooked because we were so interested in attaching the narrative of how enslaved people ate, cooked, lived to, um, a, a, to a trauma narrative. And some of it is very traumatic and very triggering and very painful. And there's over a lot of times in doing my work where I have to stop. I just, it's just too, it's too much to read some of these things, these descriptions of these, um, some things that are very horrific. Um, I might say that, you know, the black cook was always at the whim of um, so the cruelties or um, um, blind indulgences of the people who held them in bondage. Slavery was always colloquial and discretionary. It was never just one size fits all. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I can certainly catalog those for you. I choose not to at the moment. Um, and I choose not to also catalog the moments where food was used to um, pacify or tame um, enslaved people's interest in resistance, which of course they always did. That's another narrative. Resistance wasn't always, <clears throat> you know, that beautiful uh, scene in Underground where they Molotov cocktail the big house. Resistance wasn't always Nat Turner. Resistance was as simple as, I'm gonna make sure that we eat good. I'm gonna make sure that you understand that if you cross me, there will be consequences. Resistance was speaking the names okra, fevi, gumbo, which all mean the same thing, and those words coming down to us. And the resistance was the fact that <clears throat> wherever we went in the new world, in the African Atlantic world, we essentially did the same thing. We had this, this bigger mega brain that told us do the same thing. Enjoy your syncretized religion, Enjoy your Creole languages, create your own cuisine, your own identity, create your own music, your own oratory, your own liberation and resistance strategies, and make sure that you understand that you are a nation. Nashao, nation. Make sure you're a nation. And you can't detach the food from those other parts of the narrative and the story. Nor can you detach from the fact that Certain people arrived in certain places and there were limitations. Somebody coming to Massachusetts would not have had the same um, access to things as somebody living in Virginia where I am or someone living in the other part of my heritage, the Carolinas um, or in Louisiana or in Brazil or in Haiti or in Jamaica or in other places, Antigua. And so we have to understand that. But we don't, we have to also live with the fact that <clears throat> there were large parts of their food knowledge and culinary knowledge that we're never going to be privy to because we're not supposed to. Number one, in uh, and I, I'm speaking very generically here, and I and I realize that. Number one, in West Central African understandings of what is knowledge and what is wisdom and what is what's accessible in any in any endeavor, whether it's blacksmithing or cooking or spiritual work. There's always something you're not supposed to know if you're an outsider. It's not like it's not at all an open book. And the, the very fact that we think that it should have been an open book or all the things should present themselves to us. It's like the ridiculousness of someone saying, well, where did the Underground Railroad happen? You were never supposed to know. Why are you asking? That's not your business. That's not, that's not how this works. It's not like, oh, that right over, see that over there? That's where the Underground Railroad is. Okay, cool. 
Um, I'll, I'll get the dogs now. I mean, that wasn't, that's not how this works. And the same thing goes with some of this culinary history and, and food history. <clears throat> you know, um, the hush puppy is going back a little bit. Um, they're talking about a, a deep fried fritter made from corn. Corn had long been integrated into many cultures along the coast of West Central Africa, long before there we had the, the main thrust of American Southern history, which is on the other side of 1650, maybe even 1670, 1680, to the, the time of the Civil War. Well, by that time, corn had been engaging in Africa with different African ethnic groups since the 1500s. And the majority of enslaved Africans don't even arrive <clears throat> until 1690 to 1780. And some a little bit after, but most will, will not be outside of that range. And knowing these dates, knowing these things are so important, knowing the ethnic groups, knowing how they broke down in that time period, because the word Igbo only means so much in 1780 as it does in 2022, when it's much more a formal um, ethno-national understanding of polity, an ethnic group. Uh, whereas back then it was, yes, Igbo-ish, but scoured into different groups. But essentially, once you get on that boat, once you get in those environments where you are now not one of the others, it's, that's where slavery and colonialism begin to formulate identities. And so we have to be extremely careful on language. For me, it, one of the important elements is in doing this work, going back to botany and zoology and, you know, you know, pistol, stamen, femur, tibia, you know, all that stuff. Because as a black person who has taken on this work for his life to talk about our ancestors, and these are not just specimens, these are not just subjects, these are our ancestors. I know that I have to be twice as good to be just as good, maybe three times as good. I mean, um, Ketanji Brown Jackson good, because a lot of people in this field do not, do not respect and do not love us in this space because for a long time we were not in this space. And so I can't just say, okay, they cooked some pork and some sweet potatoes. I literally have to say jargon, all jargon employed, and I have to be exact, is that in this particular quarter at Rich Neck Plantation on, um, the third peninsula along the James River, these enslaved people seem to prefer <clears throat> the hind quarter of Suscrofa, the common pig, and ate it with Ipomea batatas, the common sweet potato, which probably did not look like the sweet potato that you're used to in the store. And they would use the bulb and the this and the that and the other and, and cook it in Kalanaware, which is homemade pottery, ceramics. You have to be that specific. You have to be, have that layer. You have to talk about all these things in a certain way. Because when I started doing this work, number one, there were people who did not want to talk about it because they had no background. It wasn't because they just, they, they didn't like us. It was because they had no background. They didn't want to waste any time that they felt was wasting their time on our history. And number two, um, this information, this story is profoundly um, layered. You have to have a certain level of empathy and clarity to approach the subject of, you know, enslaved people's foodways across this, the spectrum of what was early America and the, and the Atlantic, di the African Atlantic diaspora. There is a certain feeling of fulfillment when one understands the link between the things that they saw as a child, as I did, the things I could continue to see and the past, having gone to West Africa now, um, seven trips to eight different countries, um, hoping to go back in next year and beyond. And just to make those connections and connect the dots and to see the import, there is something beautiful and sustainable and spiritually purifying about understanding that 
the culture did not die with us and that it will not die with us. That there is an empowerment and that we can understand that history, not on a Facebook post, but as an enduring journey within ourselves and conversation with each other. Um, I could talk on long, 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 but I think that the, our, our, my obligation here um, with um, Dean Brownagan is to have a conversation and to answer some questions. So I'm gonna start that opening up process, Dean, and say, let, let's wrap a little bit. Wonderful, thank you so much, Michael. That was just uh, terrific. And I'll never look at a hush puppy the same again. <laughs> Good. Um, let, let's see if we can unpack some of the things that you, you mentioned in your, your talk. First of all, terminology. Mm -hmm. um, you have such powerful and pithy terminology, which is um, uh, impressive. For instance, you have a saying that your food is your flag. Can yes. you tell us a little bit more about what that means and how you came to that conclusion? Um, it's your, your, you know, the word, I'm borrowing the word from, from Spanish, bandera. And bandera is in, the, in an African Atlantic context, emblematic of your nation, your culture, your deities, your, um, the idea of, of fl flowing, fl flags flying during parades and festivities, idea of the Vodun flag in, in IT, the, all of that. So your flag, flags mean what? They mean national identity. Well, what if you're a nation within a nation within a nation? Hmm. You know, African-Americans, 80, something like 80 to 90% of us can trace our ancestry back at least one, at least one large set of our ancestors to the American South. And by the American South, I don't mean the Confederacy. They don't get to define the South. I mean, you know, the Mason-Dixon South. And then if we're gonna be honest about it, those Northern um, urban centers <clears throat> whose economies were deeply attached to the South. Well, let's, let's go ahead and say that. And what's your flag? Who are you? When we say that we're Americans, that's true. When we say that we are, are Africans, a part of the African diaspora, that is also true. But for a lot of our history, we have been um, kind of cloistered into this identity of being the orphans of the West and the orphans of Africa. Hmm. And that's, and that, okay, oh, you wanna do that? Cool. I, you know what? I know you, that's why it's so important about other cultures. I will put that mirror right back on you. Hmm. Trust me, y'all, the rest of y'all ain't got nothing original. Hmm. But I'll tell you one thing I got that's original, this nose and this hair and this brown skin and the fact that I, I dig my black eyed peas and that hasn't changed in 10,000 years and that my DNA goes back 70,000 years to the Niger River, to the Benue, to, to um, the Volta, to the Gambia, to the Senegal rivers. It's at, to the Congo, mm, I don't have to validate myself. So I say to people that your food is your flag, especially in our culture, because it tells, it, if, if nothing else is, is, is there to tell you about this long tortured and exceptional journey that we've had, our food and our plates will. And the fact that we have a whole culture of hospitality, a whole culture around, it's not just food, it's spirituality. It's not just food, it's kinesthetics. It's not just food, it's the visual quality of how you experience the food that says African Atlantic and African American. Mm. Wonderful. Um, what about culinary justice um, <laughs> as compared to food justice? Can you tell us about those two concepts? Sure. So um, in 2005, I was working on the Smithsonian Folklife Festival yet again <clears throat> in food ways. And I was, I met Brian Terry the first time, who is, you know, a lifelong friend now. <clears throat> Brian Terry is a um, um, cookbook author, uh, teacher, um, vegan chef, <clears throat> African-American. And food justice is about access to healthy, nutritious food. It's about um, 
how food can be used to um, foment a better holistic life. Diet isn't just what you put in your mouth. Diet is how you live, you know, as a whole. So I'll put it to you like this. Culinary justice is about how we manage food as one of our cultural productions. One of the aspects of our culture, our civilization, our identity. And there are times when oppressed and marginalized people don't have control access um, over that. I know there are people who go, well, excuse me, but if I copy you, I'm flattering you. Not if I'm black, mm -hmm. because copying and flattering black people is often meant theft, erasure, mm -hmm. and denial. That's, that's what it comes down to. <clears throat> when someone has the power, the platform, and the privilege to take our culture and make more money off of it, or to um, capitalize on it in ways that we never could. That's culinary injustice. Culinary justice is when the credit is, credit is given where credit is due. <clears throat> it's where we understand that we can use our culture as a means to cult a, you know, community empowerment, as a means to personal empowerment, um, where it becomes an, an, a, an, an a benefit and not a, a deficit to us as a whole. Um, you can see this, you can see the, the, the adverse reaction in some of the other elements of our culture. For example, I'll give you the biggest one of all, watermelon. Mm -hmm. You know, watermelon is, it has citrulline. Watermelon is good for your heart, your blood circulation. It's also good, the watermelon is also good for your blood sugar. Watermelon is, is, is one of the one of human beings greatest innovation. Africans living in the southern part of the continent where it it's, was desertified, <clears throat> carefully over time, brought a wild melon into domestication and used it to give them vitamins, to give them hydration. And here we are as black folks in America, I immediately admitted in the cooking gene that I didn't wanna eat water. I, it took me a long time to eat watermelon in front of white people because I was taught all these you know, little myths. And even today, um, one of my good friends, food writer, was lambasted for a grilled watermelon recipe just because it was about watermelon. He, our own people were like, hmm. someone literally said the words, this is the worst thing to happen to Black people since 1619. Okay. <laughs> really? Wow, right? Lavable, because it's this nonsense. But it shows you the degree to which the theft has occurred. The theft, I mean, starting with those awful Im you know, images from free construction and beyond of black folks stealing watermelons or minstrel music with you know, us depicted in caricature ugly ways, as opposed to us having this genius, right? This plant gives you a rind, edible rind, edible seed, medicinal seed, uh, edible fruit, juice, all these wonderful things, right? And it's healthy for us and it's important. You know, you would never know that sweet potato, watermelon, okra, okra leaves, black-eyed peas, the leaves of the same plant, hot peppers, and so on, all these things from across the African Atlantic world. And I say African Atlantic as opposed to just indigenous African because some of the things are not indigenous. But the ingenuity of our people and our culture and our culinary tradition is at stake here. Also our cultural and culinary memory. Those things that we can build on, things that we can use, we have already have <clears throat> um, black and brown young people farming with our heirlooms, great. We have chefs that are, that are going back to our heritage and recalling the importance of certain ingredients, the sesame, the this, the that, great. But we have to do it on a much larger scale. We have to teach, we have to also teach each other about our common legacies as Cape Verdeans, as African-Americans, as Northern black folks, Southern black folks. <clears throat> Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Latin folks, and so, and so on and so forth, Garifuna. We have this brilliant diversity and brilliant culinary diversity. And yet there are some things about us that are very much the same and held in common. Mm -hmm. And so culinary justice to me isn't just about, you know, saying that Nearest Green um, came up with the recipe for Jack Daniels. Culinary justice isn't just talking about who the real, um, um, Aunt Jemima was. 
Hmm. She was her name wasn't on Aunt Jemima, and no Aunt Aunt, or when there was a Jemima. It is about restoring to us the ability to use and benefit from our culture on our own terms in our own way. Hmm. Wow. So my mouth was watering when you were naming all those vegetables because it sounded precisely like my grandfather's farm, which he, excuse me, garden, which he planted every summer in South Carolina. And it's just a wonderful memory. So thank you for that. Um, So let's talk about black chefs and the way they fit into um, the kinds of, well, into culinary justice, for instance. Okay, so <clears throat> we have an extraordinary um, group of people right now. We have Nina Compton, Mashama Bailey. Um, we have um, Kevin Mitchell, BJ Dennis. We have so many people, Ashley um, Shanti. We have so many people, um, younger, older, in the middle, who are dedicated to preserving to traditions. And accurately, so um, there's a lot of nonsense out there too. I might mention I ain't going to name nobody on this call because <laughs> they all know who I'm. They know who I'm talking about, and I don't want that to happen. I I, I fear the black food mafia, but um, <laughs> I will say I will say this. I will say that it's heartwarming and empowering to understand that you know what that. At years after my letter to Paula Dean, it wasn't about Paula Dean. My letter to Paula Dean was about the fact the media continually was not focusing on African American chefs, black chefs. If you want to be African American, or not, that's your business. But black chefs in America. Um, and I just felt like the time the time was now to stop talking about Paula and Paul and Tyler Florence. And all these other people who, you know, are valuable and valid in their own careers, but to also bring into conversation more Black people in food. At that time, we had B. Smith and we had G. Garvin, mm-hmm. um, who had both done admirable and beautiful work. I mean, G. Garvin inspired me to see a, to see this um, brother, you know, chefing and making it look cool and making it look effortless. And my mom would always, my late mom always watched. Um, B. Smith and she just the beauty, the grace, the the there was something deeper about her than Martha. And it mm-hmm. wasn't just looking like us. Um, and then now we have this, now we have this whole other movement to say, you know, we're here, we have you know, Robles on television, we have a diversity of culinary voices, we have more black vegan chefs, sweet potato soul, we got grand baby cakes, we have black more black food bloggers. I didn't start that wheel but i certainly push it off the mountain Hmm. and i'm proud of it because if it means opportunities for black chefs to put their word out there and black somalis and black nutritionists and black agronomists we need all of those people it's not just the table it's not just hospitality it's the growing the food It, it it brings up narratives of who who has access to the land the water the sky that's also part of it. I mean, you know, having that garden in South Carolina meant you probably had a, had a little couple of acres to you. We did. And, and or, you're right. And then, so now it's like those things are shrinking. So we have to talk about black land ownership and black farmers. And my grandfather, Gonsley Twitty, a blessing room, was, was a great champion of that for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which he helped found. And, um, so it's 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 more it's always more than just the food. When people say, "Well, the, I don't want my food to be political," maybe your food was political from from the moment that Adam accepted that apple. Hmm. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, how about the sources for your historical interpretation in the uh, pork and beyond? Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, so when I was talking about the pork and sweet potatoes, is literally from taken from. Um, Charles Ball's narrative. And Charles Ball had a narrative called 50 Years a Slave. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's born in Maryland. And when he is a young um, man, I think a young husband, he is sold away to the cotton country, which at that point in time would have been central South Carolina. 
mm-hmm. and then later on Georgia. And he's very specific and he, he talks about food a lot. And one of the most poignant scenes, this is the thing that I said that I, like I say, it's so much more important to read the primary sources, understand the multiplicity of sources than it is to, to the fake lore, because he says that his, he talks about this great afternoon of liberation. And you know what he does? He goes and makes a salad. Mm. He say, he literally says, I was growing a garden of lettuce in a plot in the woods, which meant he probably barricaded because the deer would have eaten it up. He goes in his little garden and he gets his lettuce. He washes it off. And he says he dressed it with vinegar and he, and he happily ate his salad. That's not what we, we, we thought we were going to hear, right? Mm. His, liber- his liberation, his resistance is literally eating a salad. <clears throat> so he talks in great detail about all these different aspects. So it, it makes you think, okay, well, well, and he talks about this meal of pork and sweet potatoes. What, what's the, the connotation? Well, number one, you hear people talk about eating the scraps. What's the problem with that? There was only really one time of the year when that would have been a full blown thing. And that would have been hog killing time. And that would have been the dead of winter. Remember, there's no electricity. There's no refrigeration. So you have to do things, do that when it's the coldest. No one was, no one was slaughtering hogs every week. Mm. That wasn't a thing. <clears throat> and if you ate fresh meat from a domesticated animal, it was either injured, old, superannuated, or it was sick. And they were very careful about when they were sick because even though they understand how disease work, they knew sick animals were probably not the best to eat because you can transfer diseases from animals to humans. But having said all that, you have to, be, you have to know the archeology. span You have to know as much as you can about a site or local sites. You have to know about the local eco- ecology and ecosystems. What little plants are growing in the ground? You're walking on top of food. We don't, food wasn't just what you grew in your garden. Food was pepper grass and sassafras, persimmons, chickasaw plums, and the list goes on and on. And the ethnobotanical record is a little much harder to discover in this soil than the zoological record with the bones and everything. But at this point, we know about at least 150 plus animal and fish species and um, a numerous amounts, numerous detail on, on collected and foraged fruit. And, and greens and nuts and, and the like. So you have to really think about that compared with what you see in the Caribbean, in Brazil and West Africa. Sometimes there's exact parity, sometimes there is not. Sometimes people are eating cognate foods that are available. So for example, in West, in, when I was in Kumasi in Ghana, one of my ancestral homelands, <clears throat> I was in the market and um, they had over 60 different types of greens hmm. market. So what happens when you come to North America? Well, you gotta start looking for things in nature. You gotta start looking at the things that the, that the Europeans are growing. And we didn't eat them in the same way. You know, how is it the Europeans had turnips <clears throat> and beets and Swiss chard and colwort, you better known to us as collards <clears throat> and all these other things for generations, but they didn't make no um, greens and, and, and fat meat with hot sauce. That wasn't their thing. The Portuguese had caldo verde, but caldo verde and collard greens ain't the same thing, but you can see the, the sort of like the line of descent and the conversation. Hmm. And then you go into these records by, you go into these records and books written by these slave traders. And, they, and one of them um, says the following, he says, you know, basically it's, it's like, it's like if, if, if you wanna be a slave trader, that's what you're gonna get yourself into. And he talks about how the food is made violent with heat among the Africans. And he says that they have adopted the, he said they have adopted the cabbage soup of the Europeans, especially the wealthier ones, which may have a lot of meat in it. When he says cabbage soup, we're talking about caldo verde from the Portuguese that then becomes starts to morph. But on top of that, we're also talking about a society where you ate greens with smoked fish or other smoked proteins and meats, and you chowed down. That was a, that was a big, a big and important. Um, um, staple meal, a veggie vor diet, right? You want more meat, but you don't actually have the ability to keep it fresh. So you just get it when you can, when it's a celebration times. But I guess the bottom line of that little narrative I just told you is that to communicate the idea that these foods have really complicated 
histories and stories and they move with people. They don't just show up on their table. These women, these men, these elders, these children, they're the ones making these things move across the globe. It's not, you know, people think, oh, another thing that I hear a lot, um, Dean, is we had rice in our hair. No, we didn't. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that didn't happen. That did not happen. That happened in um, Suriname and Guyana and Brazil when, when people were on this side of the ocean. But that was to tr but that was a whole different situation. That wasn't, you know, sitting on the in, on your back during the middle passage for two to three months with rats running around you and and and, and roaches the entire time. Uh -uh -uh. That would have been um, a, a really ridiculous thing to do. But people did bring seeds in power objects, in charms that they wore, in they they brought them. Um, as steerage, as, as food brought for the journey for the enslaved that were to be planted in the new world even. They brought, pirates brought them, missionaries brought them, curious uh, ship's captains brought foods. And because of that total existence, we're able to enjoy these foods today, today that traveled a very long way. They didn't have to, they didn't have to, but they did. And that narrative alone is amazing. Mm. Well, there are many audience members who want to uh, connect with you and get in on this conversation. So I'm going to transition to audience Q&A. Sure. And here is the first question I'll ask of you. What would you like to see in research in African diaspora foodways going forward? And how do you prefer to see this knowledge disseminated? I want us to take a lot of personal responsibility for it. <clears throat> In other words, I would like us to make these conversations part of community life um, and the layers that go into it. Um, we need a lot of work done. We need people to really document, understand, and pass on the food of the great migration. To under, because of gentrification, because of redlining, because of destruction of black neighborhoods, um, because of many other forces. There is an entire history of, of, of black tastes, flavors, food institutions, chefs, personalities, cooks, um, bars, clubs, barbecue places that is being lost. Somebody has to have the memory to tell you, okay, on that corner, there was this, and this is what the menu looked like. So we really do need people to go into their <clears throat> family scrapbooks, find menus, find matchbooks, to start to chart out, to map, to interview anybody who remembers places from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, so that we can begin to document that part of, of Black food history in America. Because here's the other thing that we didn't really talk about that we should probably you know, drop before we close out is that this isn't just history of an insular history. I say that because I'm particularly interested in that, but it's also history of who is cooking for who and who influences what. Mm. You know, all the Monaco's, all those fancy Peter Luger's, all those fancy restaurants in New York, you know who's cooking at them. Mm. Formal, you know, free people of color and formerly enslaved folks. Um, we are the caterers of Boston. We are the caterers of Buffalo and Cincinnati and Philadelphia. We, it, it, there's so much there, but, on, but I don't want us to think for one second that the 20th century is safe. You mm. get me? That somehow, somewhere, some way, there'll be a little record for us to catch on to. Uh-uh, you have, you have to curate this stuff. You really have to have, you have to have your, 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 your pieces together and understand a blueprint for how you want to look at this information. Because what I don't want to have happen is we know all this stuff from our ancestors' time period, which we, we only know a little bit, actually. But we don't know what happened between the Civil War and Civil Rights. Mm -hmm. And we're losing those stories. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, there's a question uh, asking you to talk about your role in the musical Grace at Ford's Theater in DC. <laughs> yes, so bring that up. <laughs> yes, because well, the the um, 
uh, as of this weekend, <clears throat> look, we premiere in Grace. Grace was supposed to come out much earlier, but Grace actually um, is the is the story of a black catering family. Mm. And so now we have, you know, theatrical productions, musicals, things that you know can look at the food tradition head on with all this academic, but also family knowledge, interviews, experience. So, you know, food doesn't always have to be, um, I think we, we, we tread too much in, sim in symbols and not systemics. Mm. And so I think that what, what I'm looking forward to is seeing how they execute um, some of these things in song and in, and in dialogue. Um, how, you know, cause I, I mean, I know there's people who true picked up the, cu the cooking gene and they were like, I don't know if I like this. And I said, I'm so sorry to give you soul food three, the resident, the resurrection of big mama, <laughs> but that is not all of what black food is or where it comes from. They're, 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 they're uncomfortable truths to be told. And they're also beautiful, surprising, important things. Um, so one quick thing I want to tell you is that, for example, I studied Yoda by Howard University. I, to, to, to greater and lesser success. Because Yoruba has tones like Mandarin and tonal languages aren't really, really my thing. But the word E-W-A, Ewa, <clears throat> you change the tone, it's tradition. You change the tone, it's beauty. You change the tone, it's black eyed peas. Okay. So when you eat moi moi or you eat akara, traditional Yoruba wedding, between spouses, what are you saying that you want in the next generation? Tradition, beauty, and the word ewa is a pun on the term iwa, which means good character. Mm. You know, so it's not just I eat black eyed peas for good luck. Yeah, I eat black eyed peas because all these all these things that I wasn't able to communicate because of <clears throat> slavery colonialism are still in my blood memory. They're still here and they're here and they're here in my gut. Because, you know, you know, if you look, if you look at any, um, a, lot of, a lot of power objects, particularly from Central Africa and Nigeria, where is the medicine kept? It's kept in the gut of the statue. That's where the mirror is, where the, that's where they embodied the mashallah, you know, <laughs> in Senegal, Gambia. It's where this, that's where the sacred stuff goes. Because we know that part of our, our, our memory isn't cerebral, it's gut memory. It's in mm -hmm. the bacteria in our stomachs, our intestines, our digestive system. So to me, it's this, to me, it's this, it's great that we have a flowering of creative and artistic things to tell the story in different ways. It doesn't have one, it doesn't have one face. It has many. Mm, thank you. We started off talking about Facebook and hush puppies. And now there's a question about a recent viral TikTok focused on the high caloric content of fried plantains, which upset a lot of people in the African diaspora because the food tends to be stigmatized in this way, these types of foods. Yes. And counting calories is a Western concept. And this Questioner would like to know what your thoughts are about this. It's about balance. I mean, look, West Africa, there's someone said, said a documentary, the smell of Africa is the smell of things frying. And they mm -hmm. weren't lying. But it's not the same lifestyle. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bigger, it's, the health question always comes up. But I, I really want to know what what are we supposed to do? Or you know, honestly, our people do not. Our people are are are, are really stubborn and really focused on what we like, what we do. You know, it's, it's that's one element. You're not gonna take you're not gonna take fried plantains out of the diet of Sub-Saharan Africans and Caribbean folk and Afro Latin folk. It's, and those of us who are African American who adopted these readopted these foods and not it's not going to happen but i'm not I'm, I'm less worried about plantains and i'm more worried about 
the foods that we were forced to eat or encouraged to eat or become accustomed to eat that we have we have very little um bio relationship with hmm. wheat rye barley gluten you know not the same as rice plantain banana sweet potato yam cassava um millet sorghum which not the same foods and so yes your your life in balance is very important a lot of us are trying to navigate that we understand the importance to our health <clears throat> of navigating that, but also the importance of also rejecting some of these Western ways in terms of food. You know, we got along quite famously and quite well for 70,000 years. Hmm. I mean, right. you have to ask yourself the question, what, what's to blame here? So I, so I would just say that, you know, when people try to like, you know, gotcha on our traditional foods or whatever, you have to ask yourself the question, What's an everyday food? What's celebration food? Mm. You know, just, just because, and I know that in, in England, in America, in Canada and Australia, other places in the English speaking Africa, a diaspora of Africans, you know, a lot of these foods are celebration foods that will remind you who you are. Mm -hmm. But here's the bottom line. That's true for many ethnic groups. You know, so that you those things are special. But I want to people remind people there's also everyday soul. There's roasted plantains, mm -hmm. and plantains is part of vegetable soup and and, and groundnut stew. There is rice and beans that ain't that's very very plebeian, very fiber driven. Mm -hmm. There's all these wonderful things that we what we ate to sustain us <clears throat> that had that were not especially greasy or fattening or whatever. They were just foods that we prepared for ourselves from day to day that were flavorful and gave us sustenance. And that's where we need to put our focus. Mm. We have time for one last question. Sure. And this seems like a great one to conclude on. Um, could you talk about the work you're doing to engage with chefs across the African Atlantic and how we can support that work? So right now, um, <clears throat> our trips have kind of been on hiatus for the past Three, two, two and a half years. Our last food pilgrimage to West Africa was um, in 2020. <clears throat> My good friend Ada Nago Brown has a company called Roots to Glory. And I said to her, well, why don't we take chefs um, to the continent um, to learn more about our African, West African origins in terms of food? So far, we've gone to Ghana. Benin and Togo and Senegal and Gambia. And we're hoping to go to Congo, the two Congos next year or the year after. Um, and that'll be very special for me because one of my um, blood cousins from West Africa is Sundi, which is one of the um, um, sub-ethnic groups that belongs to the Congo people. And so I'm just like, okay, so I get to go, I get to go to my village. I get to go to my people, right? And the, you know, the Congo has such a very proud and aristocratic history and long history in Central Africa. Um, and so we're hoping, we're hoping that um, we can start that up again. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna put out you know, uh, crowdfunding for our chefs when we finally do get a trip booked because a lot of our chefs can't afford to go without the crowdfunding. I often you know, take off chunks of my proceeds from the cooking gene and I guess from kosher soul to come. By the way, everybody pre-order kosher soul. It's so important for those authors of us of color that our voices are heard. And it starts with pre-ordering, making sure there's a buzz, making sure that people know that our product is worth something. That means that the next generations of black authors get their proposals accepted and get to, and get to work. Mm. So and that's why I just wanna make sure that's very clear to people. And, and it goes across the board. For, for authors who are women, LGBTQ, and so forth. We, we need, marginalized voices need your, your financial support through pre-ordering, ordering, and, and getting that, putting that book in a picture on a thing. But we will start up our trips, um, uh, we hope next year. And the goal is to not only have those chefs have an experience, but almost all of them have come back 
and have the most explosive creative and culinary um, life in their communities after these trips. I mean, they never see the world the same way again. And I'm so proud that now we've got two, we got not only them, but two, three groups of their students deep mm, engaging uh -huh. in that knowledge as well. Wow, this has been extraordinary, Michael. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and thank you again to the Rural House and Slave Quarters. I also wanna thank uh, all of you in the audience for joining us today and for your excellent questions. I hope you'll join us again soon for another program. You can find information about Radcliffe's upcoming uh, programs on our website. Have a nice evening.